Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for watching and listening to the Woodsong Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Larson, and I thought we'd take a little bit of time today to talk about books that can help us to study not only bushcraft, but the entire natural world, including outdoor living skills and beyond. I see it brought up a lot of times online. People are looking to learn more about the wilderness, how to live in the wilderness, and there are really three ways, in my opinion, three ways to further your knowledge that you need to have. You need to have all three um, to really have a well-rounded wilderness education. So there's the first one, which is uh, formal education. That means you're going to a school to learn these things. You're going to a bushcraft school, and um, the, the best thing to do actually would be to go to multiple schools. If you're going to one, odds are your information is going to get pretty inbred, and you're going to think that one way is the only way to do something, and you're not going to be subjected to other skills. Uh, this field that we're studying, guys, is such a broad uh, range, such a broad field, and if we're just looking at one little part of it, we're, we're not going to see the bigger picture. We're going to leave things out. We're going to become closed-minded in our beliefs, and so we don't want to do that. So multiple, learn from multiple teachers, so to speak, um, and maybe it's not you going to a formal school. Maybe it's you know someone who lives in the woods and they can act as like a mentor to you. So someone else teaching you these skills through a mentorship program or through a, a wilderness living school. There's a few good ones out there. That's a, another podcast though. The second way is personal field education. So you going out, preferably by yourself or with other folks as well, to study, to practice the skills, whether that's fire making, shelter building, or any of the other uh, skills we're gonna discuss here during this video, you in the field by yourself. The third way is through formal, not well, informal I should say, uh, through book education. So reading and studying different texts. This is probably looked down upon in by some folks, which there's no reason for that at all. Books have always been a great way of studying almost anything. The one negative side to books, I would say, is, uh, and a lot of people maybe don't see this, but books actually do have a very dark side to them and that a lot of books have been published in the genre of bushcraft or survival that really are not made with good intentions. They're made to, to make money especially with some of the older books. They're made to capture readers, to get them to buy the book, but they don't have sound instruction within them. So we need to kind of weed through that and find out. And I actually have a, a buddy who, uh, he, he gets interviewed for the news a lot because he's a, a pretty well-known instructor. And he gets asked about TV shows a lot. And he says, well, yeah, TV shows can fake a lot of this wilderness stuff, but hey, have you ever opened an old survival book? <laughs> they can they can teach some really crummy things as well. So, without further ado, I'm going to show you some of the books that I have that I use to study with when I'm at home. If we're looking at this in a practical manner, uh, nobody is 100% outside all of the time. Even if you live in some remote off-grid cabin, you are a human being, therefore you do not have fur, therefore you cannot stay outside uh, year round. You have to go indoors sometimes in the winter to sleep, what have you. It, it's neither here nor there. There's gonna be a time where you can benefit from reading books, uh, doing an independent study through books. So I broke down some of my books into a few different categories. This might be what gets most interesting to folks. So when people think of a, a book to study bushcraft or survival or outdoor living, whatever you want to say, uh, oftentimes they think of one book. What's the best book for XYZ? What's the book to do, uh, to, to read? And there is not any the book. In fact, I would say the, the more books you can get that are good books, the better. I have personally written a book. We're not going to talk about it very much today, maybe, but my second edition is coming out uh, here within probably a month of To Tread in Wild Places by Sam Larson. 
Uh, that'll be announced here on the podcast. So if you are interested, stay tuned. Keep watching the podcast or go to woodsongwilderness.com. Follow me on you know Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. It'll I'll, I'll let you know, trust me, when the uh, the second edition of my book comes out. But, uh, oh, I got off topic. What am I thinking of? So a lot of people think there's just this one blanket survival manual. I put them into categories. Once again, I do need to say uh, some of my favorite books I actually don't have here today. But the I have enough books in my possession right now to give a good representation of, of what I feel uh, you can use to study from. The categories I broke these books down to are general bushcraft and outdoor living skills. It's on my phone. Uh, <laughs> outdoor cooking, plant identification, plant utilization, so food, crafting, etc. Outdoor leadership, nature interpretation and awareness, wilderness medicine, animal utilization, food, tools, etc. Culture and lifestyle, and guidebooks. So notice, there's a lot of other different categories. For me personally, I found that some of the most beneficial reading and, and some of the most beneficial texts that I've looked over are not books that are about bushcraft as a whole. They're books that pick one aspect of it and go deeper. That's why we have all these different categories. You can benefit much, much more from a book that's all about one thing, like like brain tanning buckskin, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start grabbing literally piles of books, showing them to you. For those of you who are, who are watching this on YouTube, this podcast is on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. So some of you, uh, if you want to see what the book looks like, if you want to look it up on Amazon or at your library or wherever, go to YouTube to check that out uh, whenever you have a minute. I'll try to get the uh, the author's name. I'll try to pronounce it correctly on all of these. And uh, let's get going. So category one. All right, so category one, general bushcraft and outdoor living skills. This is actually the category that my book to tread in wild places would be in. It's a, it's a general book and mine is actually intended for folks who are getting their start and wanting a foundation, you know, to teach basically everything you need to know just to go out and be comfortable in the woods. You're not going to know everything. You're going to know enough though, to go to the woods and be comfortable. These are all encompassing books. Unfortunately, the one book I don't have here that I really enjoy is this, the big heavy hitter is Bushcraft by Morse Kahansky. I was reading it last week. I was looking through something and I misplaced it. So maybe it's under my couch or in a couch cushion. Maybe it's, uh, that I left it at some building or in the car. I, I don't know where it is. It's gone. Uh, but Bushcraft by Morse Kahansky. It's got excellent line drawings. It's particularly good for folks who have a lot of raw materials to work with. So someone who has to do kind of a leave no trace type thing is going to benefit a whole lot less from this. However, these are necessary skills to learn. These are core bushcraft skills when it comes to crafting that you need to know, including how to hang a pot over a fire, uh, how to, um, gosh, he teaches so many things. He teaches about fire, shelter, intricacies of, of how to arrange your shelter and your fire, a little bit of outdoor cooking. He teaches a lot of things in, in his book, Bushcraft. It's an excellent book. So Bushcraft by Morse Kahansky, that's the first book. Another one that's real popular in the genre is Outdoor Survival Skills by Larry Dean Olson. And if you get a chance, get the new addition to this book. I have the old one just for the sake of nostalgia. You're going to get a lot more value out of the newest edition. Actually, this book encouraged me to put out a second edition of mine to not be prideful and to say, hey, you've, you've got some things you can contribute and make it a whole lot better. Um, this book, although it's got great content in it, it was made decades and decades and decades ago. 
So I'm showing the camera this right now. It's basically very, very old photography, even though it's good. It's great for its time. I mean, it was, it was incredible when it came out back in the G whiz. Was it like the sixties? The year on this is flippity flip. Brigham Young University Press edition published 1967. So printing of books has gone a long way since 1967. Uh, but it, it makes the list absolutely for the general bushcrafting category. Outdoor Survival Skills by Larry Dean Olson, Brigham, Brigham Young University Press. Another one, this is really, really an old book, but I categorized it in here because uh, I think it fits. It's called Pole, Paddle, and Portage by, let's see the author's first name, Bill Riviere, R-I-V-I-E-R-E. -E. And Bill basically goes through what it takes to travel by canoe. It's a very old book. Copies though are cheap. You can get them because they're, they're just not in high, it's just not in high demand necessarily. But I've gotten a lot of good little tips, especially when it comes to living out of a canoe and traveling by canoe. Um, so it's, it's great for all those things. Now, if we're going a little bit into the modern portion of outdoor living, a great, great book is Alan and Mike's really cool backcountry ski book. I got a copy of this when I was just a, a young guy, probably like 12 or 13, maybe even younger. And I remember I, I wore it out so much that my dad had to pay the library for it. Uh, I just love tearing through it, but it's filled with all these little tips and tricks. And this is all about living in the wilderness with some modern uh, modern uh, outdoor living tools. So it's a lot of leave no trace style stuff, uh, tips and tricks of winter camping. So winter is is the main uh, thing to focus on here. This is all about winter. And then here's a great one, the National Outdoor Leadership Schools Wilderness Guide. So this is all about wilderness travel. So traveling overland in uh, in the wilderness by Mark Harvey. So if you're looking to travel, take a group out, you wanna get your uh, your boxes checked as far as the planning is concerned, route planning, all that good stuff. The Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School Wilderness Guide is a great book to have. I feel like this is the category I'm leaving the most out of, but I wanna emphasize that some folks put too much into this category. They they think all their books should have as much possible info smashed into them, which is not necessarily the case. Um, however, you do need to read some of the books in this category because there's some great ones. They're great books to start out with and to look through over time so that you can maintain your skills, so to speak. So. These are good bedside books even to flip through and to say, oh, I remember you know, seeing this technique in this book. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. So we're gonna say outdoor cooking is our next category. This is one that's really overlooked. People forget that you have to eat when you go to the woods and eat well. And these books are gonna help you do that. They go from modern to a uh, little bit more primitive, although I don't have anything that's truly about primitive cooking here. There are probably some good books I should listen uh, or listen to that I should read on that. If you have any books, by the way, if you're I'm going through a category and you're like, hey, you didn't mention this one, put it in the comments. Uh, let's let's talk about it and uh, maybe we'll we'll help each other out on that. The Well-Fed Backpacker by June Fleming. Obviously, this one is going to focus on um, this one's going to focus on techniques for backpackers. So people who want to travel really, really light into the backcountry. So it's all focused on you know lightweight stuff, stuff you can shove into a backpack. So the Well-Fed Backpacker by June Fleming. If you're a, a backpacker, you're sick of eating crummy uh, mountain house meals. Do that. Another great one, Knowles, by the way, National Outdoor Leadership School publishes great books all around. They're not a bushcrafter survival school by a long shot. They're 
an outdoor leadership school, but well worth the read on these things. So another modern outdoor cooking book, Cookery, National Outdoor Leadership School, edited by Claudia Pearson. So Cookery, this is the fifth edition, is the one I flip through. Knowles is, is, I would say, world famous actually for their rationing and recipes for backcountry meals. So check this out. Industry leader in, uh, in modern outdoor backcountry cooking. Trail Cooking by John Weiss, or Weiss, W-E-I-S-S. -S. This is just another good one in the category. Again, it, it runs along the, the lines of backpacking meals. Uh, it goes through gear, different things to help you out on the trail. So John Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, -S, Trail Cooking and Outdoor Life book, he calls it. Uh, yep, excellent book. And then this one is actually written by my friend Tim Smith, who I interviewed on episode two of the podcast. And it's called The Woods Cook, Outdoor Cooking with a Professional Guide. Tim is a master main guide, which means a lot, very difficult to keep and maintain your master main guide. It means you've been a guide uh, working with people in the outdoors for no shorter than 10 years. So 10 or more years, he's closer to 20 years on his. I think beyond 20 years actually, but he goes through different techniques that he uses to cook particularly for sizable groups, you know, 10 to 12 in the back country. This book is different though, because it's not about backpacking. So it's not about being light. It's about making good food in the outdoors in an old school way. So he uses a lot of cast iron, uh, a lot of good recipes as well. A lot of almost original recipes, I think, that Tim has come up with out here. Tim, by the way, is one of the best cooks that I have ever experienced. Oh my goodness, he can make anything taste good out in the woods. So I, I know a lot of folks aren't just jumping for joy over these cooking books about the outdoors, but I recommend all of them, read them. You're gonna learn a lot from them. I know I did. So I might be going out of order from what I read uh, earlier, but our next category of books is gonna be uh, Nature Interpretation and Awareness. This is a pretty broad uh, field here that we're looking at. Uh, we're gonna go over a, a few different things, uh, but the first one, and this is you know reading what are the intentions of an animal. For anyone who spends a lot of time in the outdoors, you know you're not always just sitting around crafting things. There's an element of adventure, there's an element of travel, uh, you know, overland, whether that's hiking or paddling. Um, not everyone just goes to the stinking woods and makes bacon all day and drinks coffee. Even though I like doing that, uh, there's, there's obviously more to do. Uh, or batons through a uh, pieces of wood all day. That's that's not the most fun thing about being in the woods. The most fun thing is the adventure. And this will all help you to have more of a well-rounded experience during your adventure and to feel more like you're at home in the wilderness. This There's so many little tips and tricks in here. The first one is called Bear Attacks, Their Causes and Avoidance. And that's by Stephen Herrero, S-T-E-P-H-E-N. He's one of those guys. Herrero, H-E-R-R-O. E R O. This is the industry leading book for bear attacks. So this is the, basically the number one book that's ever come out on the subject. So uh, bear attacks by Stephen Herrero, how to avoid them, uh, what to look for, bear mannerisms, how to keep out of trouble in bear country essentially is what it is. And if things go bad, how to, how to make the best of your situation. The next couple books in here are going to be on tracking. They're slightly different. There's also another, you know, more tracking books that I like. Uh, the SAS book, I believe, on tracking is a good one. I've got that. I don't know where, uh, but I have it. And uh, start off, this is a really good simple guide. It's the Stokes Wilderness Guide to, uh, to Tracking. So Animal Tracking and Behavior by Donald and Lillian Stokes. Very good one. So if you're sitting down and thinking, man, I would like to know what that animal's doing when I see those tracks, this is a good one to study. <coughs> ah, big sneeze. 
And uh, it's, it's an overview. So an overview of animal behavior and tracking, how to look at tracks and uh, find out what that critter is is doing and how to identify the critter. If you're talking uh, whether it's a coyote or wolf or domestic dog, you know, th that's a good book to, to read if you have those types of questions. Another one that's become really popular uh, and it should be even more popular is Tracking and the Art of Seeing How to Read Animal Tracks and Sign by Paul Rezendez, R-E-Z-E-N-D-E-S, Paul Rezendez. And Paul has kind of an interesting background. He's not a hunter. A lot of times you think tracking and hunting go hand in hand and they do. But what he is, is a photographer. So he's used his tracking skills to become a better photographer. You know, as a wilderness photographer, you have to find out uh, where these critters are and uh, you have to know what they're doing, where their routes might be. So tracking has been incredibly instrumental to him. There are so many details in this book that, I mean, it would take you decades and decades to pick up on some of the stuff that he puts in this 200 or whatever pages. So instrumental in learning about animal behavior in the woods. Possibly the best book on tracking that's available. The next part of this is uh, is more of the bird side of things. So bird language. I'm going to start off by recommending the number one book on bird language that exists right now or... or um, yeah, in, in my in my mind at least. It's by John Young, What the Robin Knows. Robins are a good bird to learn from because robins don't generally uh, migrate. So you're going to see robins in January. You're also going to see them in July. Um, I don't think that's different anywhere else in the country. If it is, let me know in the comments. Learn something new every day. But this is uh, him introducing you to the world of bird language through uh, the everyday robin and the robin is found all over the world so it's a it's a good one for anyone no matter where you live nature interpretation bird language what the robin knows the next one i'm going to introduce to you guys and we've actually got her lined up for a, a podcast uh, about bird language bird id this is an incredible bird lady is christy dragness and her curriculum bird mentor you actually have to go directly to christy dragonus i think it's birdmentor.com if you search bird mentor christy dragonus it's k-r-i-s-t-i-d-r-a-n-g-i-n-i-s i'm probably pronouncing your name wrong sorry christy uh but you'll get over it you're nice uh is <laughs> a so christy dragonus uh is the author here she wrote an entire curriculum on bird identification, uh, bird language, and, and everything in between. How to tell a bird from its feather, different things like that. And you can actually take a full-on course from a distance with her. So she does distance learning bird courses, highly recommended, and I need to do it this spring or summer. It's called Bird Mentor. And the last one is Eric Sloan's weather book. This completely changes directions in the whole nature interpretation thing, but it's how to look at the sky and interpret the weather, how to, how to look at the sky and how weather patterns are affecting the natural world and say, I believe X, Y, Z is going to happen uh, in the next day or few days or hour. It is a must read for anyone who travels through the wilderness on foot or boat or anything like that, horseback. Um, you need this book if you're going to be out in the woods away from any kind of technology. You're going to be uh, the weatherman of the group if you have this book. Um, and I don't believe it's, it, it's a short read and it's very simple language. It is, uh, it's where, uh, one good example is the, the saying... Uh, red sky by morning, uh, sailors fair warning. Red sky at night, sailors delight. Um, that's where I learned about that. So this this book, and that's been one that's helped me whew, through some really crummy times. It's helped me get ready before the storm or plan a nice productive day the next morning. 
all that through the skills of uh, weather forecasting in the bush. So Eric Sloan's, so E-R-I-C-S-L-O-A-N-E, apostrophe S, weather book. The next category that kind of piggybacks off that last court, uh, category is guidebooks. And for that, I've got two enormous books that are going to have most of the information that you're going to need about different critters. And these are guides like bird guides. So the first one is National Wildlife Federation Field Guide to Birds of North America. Obviously, if you're not in North America, this is going to have a different effect on you. But it's a good one by Edward S. Brinkley. And I use this one anytime I say, oh, there's a, there's a new bird. Let's see if we can find it. You can flip through this and, uh, and find something that looks like your bird. It's got nice little splotches uh, on maps of where that bird frequents. So you can say, okay, that bird is in Northeast Minnesota. Uh, usually they're larger than that, but that's a good example. So field guide to birds in North America. And the other one is Mammal Tracks and Sign, a Guide to North American Species by Mark L. Broch. And uh, this is an excellent, excellent book, Mammal Tracks and Sign. If you see a track and you say, oh my goodness, I've got no, like I, I kind of know what kind of animal left this, but I don't know if it's a, a Martin or, or what. You can look at this. This will help you out a lot. It's got, man, all of them. And we're talking North America, guys. So North America goes from the northernmost, you know, right north of South America. That should go without saying. So all of Central America, Mexico, United States, Canada, it's all included in this. And uh, yeah, I mean, this it's a great book. Uh, it, it This book, what's really special about it, it'll show you tracks. And like the, uh, like the title says, it will also give you sign. And so sign can mean a, a lot of different things. Uh, one of the things it means is poop. So we get a, an encyclopedia of poop almost included with this. So if you look at a piece of poop and you think, oh my, uh, you know, I don't know what... Uh, what that poop is from. This book is a huge help. I actually used this on Vancouver Island uh, after I got back, I should say. I didn't have the book with me, but I saw this really interesting looking poop out there in the woods and I didn't know who it was from. It looked like a dog poop, but there were no dogs out there. I thought, you know, there are wolves out here, but it has had a different types of colors in it and it had some pieces of shell in it. And I said, there's no way wolves eat shellfish so it couldn't be a wolf looked it up in here turns out it was a wolf and those particular wolves actually eat shellfish so <laughs> it made perfect sense but i had to have this book as a reference before i actually knew that so it's a great one to have around the next category i'm going to go through is plant identification and there are a lot of great books to go through on this don't get me wrong but the one I have here today, and it's a good one to have around, is Botany in a Day by Tom Elpel. Thomas Elpel, Thomas J. Elpel, I should say. And for those of you watching on YouTube, that's right. That is his signature. I know Tom. He's a great guy. I want to have him on here for a podcast. I just haven't been able to reach out to him yet. But Tom's book, Botany in a Day is a guide to identifying plants by their families. So you take these plants and you say, okay, they have this uh, similarity. That means they're in the same family. So you can essentially, if you master this book, you can be in Asia, in a place you've never been before, and see a plant, identify it using the patterns method that he describes in this book, and say, I don't know what it's called, but I know I can eat it or I know I can utilize it in some other way. So Tom Elpel, Botany in a Day. Uh, funny story actually about Botany in a Day. I was taking a, uh, a little refresher course. Uh, I was working as a guide here in Lincoln for a school program and 
I asked the person teaching the course um, if they had any books on plants that they recommended for plant identification, and they pulled out this book by Tom L. Pell. So uh, it, it's a it's a big one. If you want to learn about plant identification, Botany in a Day is the book you want to get for that. And I, I'm going so fast through these books, I'm not giving them justice. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of an idea of where to go to study when you're stuck at home for a long time. Like if it's 20 below like it is right now, or you've got a bunch of kids, you can't just go wandering through the woods all the time like you used to do when you were a young buck. Next category we're gonna talk about is plant utilization. So we're talking all encompassing. We're talking food, we're talking, uh, just got a text from Tim Smith, listen to the uh, the uh, Joe Robinette podcast. He said he, he liked it. Gee whiz, thanks Tim. Uh, <laughs> starting over, um, so our next category is gonna be plant utilization. So that's food, utility, whatever you're using it for. Um, you can't go through this category without including this author, Sam Thayer, guys. S-A-M-U-E-L-T-H-A-Y-E-R. Man, I'd love to do a podcast with this guy. He essentially guinea pigs himself out and st studies studies uh, wild edible plants through uh, his, his own experimentation in many ways. He's also uh, a, a big bookie, so he, he that's totally wrong uh, use of the word bookie, but he, uh, he, he reads a lot of books, and then he says, you know what, I don't know if this is right. So he tests it himself. He doesn't just take that book uh, as 100% fact all the time. Thankfully, he's been able to not die, first of all, because we need him, and come up with some great things that the world may never have known had Sam Thayer not looked into them. Best example of this is with his study of milkweed. So prior to Sam Thayer, milkweed was thought of more as a toxic plant than an edible plant. And that's because way, way, way back in the day, this is Sam's theory, is that, um, is that basically they were misidentifying milkweed as, uh, as I believe, is it dogbane? Dogbane probably. Uh, so they're lookalikes. And dogbane is extremely bitter. Milkweed is more of a sweet taste, but they were they were cooking this plant and saying, okay, I guess you can eat it, but it's bitter, it tastes bad. They were saying you had to boil the plant and change the water out four or five times. And by then, what nutrition is there really in that plant anyway? Sam said, you know what? I'm just gonna try it myself and uh, maybe I won't change the water. Maybe I'll boil them in the water and drink the water. None of these things we recommend you do, by the way, but Sam did them. And through this, Sam has basically come to a conclusion, and I'll probably simplify this or mess it up, but he says that if you want to cook milkweed, really you just have to boil it, pitch the water, and then you know cook it some other way or eat it just like that. So one boiling can extract enough toxins to make the plant really, really good for you. So this one is the Forager's Harvest. Sam Thayer, Samuel Thayer, actually has a new book out that I have not gotten yet but I need to get it. Uh, Nature's Garden is his other book that I have. It's just not around here. Samuel Thayer, you, you need to have his book and to look through it and to study from it if you want to learn about how to eat plants in the woods. Artificial bacon bits get old after a while. Gotta know those plants, guys. The next one, this is, um, actually, I'll, I'll switch this up. I'm going to do this one next. Yeah. Preserving wild foods. A modern forager's recipe for curing, canning, smoking, and pickling by Matthew Weingarten and R Raquel uh, Pelzel. This book was a lot of fun. It's not your typical wilderness education type book. Um, it, it's got some modern cultivated plants in it, but it's made by basically a, a swanky chef who is delving into the world of foraging and making really good meals and really good little recipes out of it. So I think there's like jams in there, there's cordial, there's 
different things like that if you want to spice up your foraging life. Preserving Wild Foods by Matthew Weingarten, W-E-I-N-G-A-R-T-E-N, and Raquel, R-A-Q-U-E-L, P-E-L-Z-E-L. You were just like, man, Sam got into my head so bad there. I have no idea what he just said. Um, but Preserving Wild Foods, it's a, it's a very good book if you want to expand a little bit. Um, it almost didn't make the list just because it's such a, a foreign ideology to, to like craft fancier things from foraging. But spice up your life with that book, guys. That could be a t-shirt. All right. The next one is by an author who should need no introduction. Um, it's called Royal BC Museum Handbook Plant Technology of First Peoples in British Columbia. I purchased this one in British Columbia. It is by the Nancy J. Turner. And this one is about utilizing plants for utility use. So spoons utensils, um, different types of tools you can make with them, all sorts of things like that. Identification is in here as well, as it is in most of them. Yep, weaving bas basketry, uh, things like that. And it's more of a book on how the First Nations people use them uh, than a step-by-step -step guide to XYZ. But this is a documentation of how First Peoples in the United States, uh, particularly British Columbia, Utilized the natural world. We've got tons to learn from this, um, and I am due for a reading of it. So, great book on ethnobotany by Nancy Turner. Nancy Turner has a ton of good books. You should get them all. Um, Shelters, shacks, and shanties is the next one. Remember, I said utilize plants. So, this is like utilizing poles of trees. This is by DC Beard. For those of you guys who don't know, uh, DC Beard is one of the founders of Boy Scouts. And so back in the day, Boy Scouts used to be a lot of this, a lot of finding and crafting things from the woods. And it doesn't disappoint. It's simple drawings of things, uh, of sometimes not so simple structures. If you're looking for a, an idea book on structure making, this is, this is where you wanna go. It's what can I do with the resources around me to make a comfortable home in the woods. Shelter Shacks and Shanties, DC Beard, very popular one. A lot of you have probably read that one or owned that one. This one's a bit of a stretch to include in the plant utilization category, but it's a lot of wood. There's a little bit of metal fabrication in here, so it's not all about plants, but it's enough about plants. Um, <laughs> Building Outdoor Gear. This is by Gil Gilpatrick. Gil Gilpatrick, by the way, is a well-known canoe guide from Northern Maine, another Maine guide. And he goes through techniques of making, uh, he makes a, a box to store your, your gear while you're canoeing. Uh, he makes a paddle, a canoe seat, a pack frame, uh, along with, uh, I believe, a reflector oven maybe. No, yeah, reflector oven, buck saw, how to make outdoor gear. And this takes a little bit of, uh, you know, tools. He, he shows a lot about like varnishing and fiberglassing things. But as a general rule, and if you want to delve a little bit more into the making of gear, this is a good one to go to. The category we're going to touch on next is wilderness medicine. And this is going to be more of a tell and tell than a show and tell. I've got one. This is our little pocketbook. It might look familiar to you guys who are watching it on YouTube. If you're watching this on iTunes or Stitcher, you have no idea what I'm showing you. Um, Wilderness and Travel Medicine, a Comprehensive Guide by Eric A. Weiss, MD. Um, this is the book that was in the old school alone first aid kits. So this is like, this is the only reading you had on the, on the alone experience back in the day. This is my, yeah, I, I remember stupid of me. I didn't, I didn't read this sucker and I, I had enough free time, right? I never read it, but it is here and I have read it since I've come back. It's got a lot of 
uh, good information on fixing yourself up if something goes wrong. So for wilderness medicine, wilderness first aid, this is a great pocket guide. If you're looking to look go further into this, I would say definitely look into the National Outdoor Leadership School's books about wilderness medicine. That's the go-to source, and that's the source that uh, is is biggest in the industry, essentially. Their Wilderness Medical Institute that they have out in Lander, Wyoming, teaches at least hundreds, if not thousands of people to become uh, wilderness first responders and wilderness EMTs. I've actually visited Wilderness Medical Institute out there in Lander, Wyoming. It's an excellent place, an excellent location to use those skills if you've got a free two weeks to a month and a few thousand dollars on your hands. The next category, certainly overlooked, but incredibly important. Guys, it's outdoor leadership. And the best way, obviously, to learn outdoor leadership is by watching other outdoor leaders in the field or by being in the field yourself and overcoming things. The first one is the Appalachian Mountain Club Guide, so the AMC Guide to Outdoor Leadership. Trip Planning, Risk Management, Group Dynamics, and Decision Making by Alex Kosef. K-O-S-S-E-F-F. And Alex is a guide himself with real world experience. He uses different scenarios that he's seen out in the wilderness to teach, you know, what did they do wrong? What's the best way to be a leader? Uh, he makes a very good, uh, you know, example of being an outdoor leader. He compares it to being a parent in a lot of ways and just gives a really good perspective on what it means to be a leader in the outdoors. So I, I love this book, guys. This is, an, this is an excellent book. And I know I'm saying this about a lot of books, but I'm kind of a book nerd. Definitely a book nerd, I should say. Here's Gil Gilpatrick coming back at us again. The Canoe Guides Handbook. How to plan and guide a trip for two to 12 people. And guys, it does not get more simple and more straightforward than this book. He has a lot of great tips on leadership. He tells about bad decisions he's made, good decisions he's made. He talks also about what to carry on a canoe trip and about how to pack, how to make sure you don't leave anything at home. And uh, he, he also talks a lot about just general outdoor education. Why is it important? Why do we need formal outdoor education? Why do we need to learn from the wilderness? He talks about these in this book. So Gil Gilpatrick, The Canoe Guides Handbook, another one you can score real cheap on Amazon at least. I believe I got mine on Amazon. I probably find it in a thrift store or a, a library up in the Northeast as well. And last but most certainly not least is the role of the instructor in the Outward Bound Educational Process by Kenneth R. Kalish or Kalish. Anyhow, he talks about how Outward Bound teaches leadership. Um, you know, how do they teach their instructors? And he also goes into a little bit of the, the history of the outdoor leader and how outdoor leadership in the field kind of became a thing. So if you were learning about the wilderness and you wanted to go to a formal school back in the 60s, basically your choices are Boulder Outdoor Survival School or uh, National Outdoor Leadership School or Outward Bound. So this is, this is the Outward Bound techniques for uh, outdoor leadership, the role of the instructor excellent read. A lot of people want to become instructors. They think it's all about skills, uh, like hard skills, bow drill, things like that. It is, but guys, it's a lot about leadership as well. You got to be a leader and to be a leader, you got to be a reader sometimes. So that's a good book. Next category we're going to go into is animal utilization. So that's for eating, using their, their furs, pelts, all that good stuff. First two kind of go hand in hand. They're by different authors about similar things. So The Edible Seashore by Rick M. Harbo. And Living Off the Sea by Charlie White. I picked both of these up in a bookstore in Port Hardy, British Columbia. 
they're great for those wanting to learn, hey, how do I get how do I get food from the ocean? And that's all I really need to say about them, <laughs> to tell you the truth. It's, hey, live by the ocean. You want to eat? Read these books. They'll tell you how. I should mention that they do specify the Pacific uh, rather than the Atlantic, although I'm sure there's a lot of carryover to the Atlantic as well. It's written specifically for the Pacific. American Pacific. That's the that's the ocean we have on the, the west coast of the U.S., by the way. Those of our listeners from abroad. Next is an awesome book. If you are going to learn about buckskins and you don't have an instructor holding your hand, first, it's great to learn from an instructor on this, but if you don't, never fear. Deer Skins to Buckskins, second edition, revised and updated by Matt Richards. This is an awesome book, guys. This gives a straightforward, simple approach to learning how to make buckskins. So you don't even have to be a hunter, by the way, to do this. You can utilize roadkill. You can utilize um, the hides of animals that hunters don't utilize. What we got to keep in mind is I would say at least 95% of the deer that are shot in my state the hide just goes to waste. It just rots. That doesn't have to be the case. Tons of folks want to learn how to make buckskins. And if you have, know a hunter and you ask them, hey, can I borrow your buckskin? I've got this book. I want to learn how to how to tan hide. Um, or can I take your, your raw hide, by the way? It's not called buckskin until it's all made. But that would be the best way to do it. And every hunter I've asked that I kind of know has said, no problem take the hide it's gonna rot otherwise so matt richards deer skins to buck skins he gives a simple approach guys how to tan with brains soap or eggs and a lot of folks it's particularly bad on the internet oh my goodness and in folklore general people have stories oh it's so hard to do xyz and it's hard work but it's not overly complex it's a relatively simple process if you just have someone to teach you the way even through a book so if you want to make hides or uh, buckskins make hides if you want to make buckskins this is the one to go with and another really really important one as a general hunter gatherer book the Modern Hunter Gatherer by Tony Nestor. And this book is one that I recommend to everyone who goes on a loan. Uh, I wish I had read it before I went uh, out on a loan. It's a very short read, it's like 90 pages, but it gives you a good mindset and a good perspective on what it takes to utilize the land for your benefit. So what it takes to, to live off the land, so to speak, through food and talks about trapping raccoons. There's, I think, three or four different traps that are really important. He doesn't add unnecessary clutter to this book. It's straightforward, and it allows you to learn the most important things about living in the woods. So the most important things about eating scurrying animals. Uh, it's not about big game, by the way. You're not going to see him teach you how to skin a deer in this book. Just not the most practical way to live off the land all the time. Sometimes it is not in this case though. So the modern hunter gatherer, a practical guide to living off the land by Tony Nestor, get it, read it in two hours and benefit from this knowledge for the rest of your life. And our last category, possibly the most important, possibly the most overlooked. It is, the category of culture and lifestyle. We've got modern culture and lifestyle. We've got ancient or older culture and lifestyle. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Keeping on the topic of Tony Nestor, by the way, we're doing a podcast with him. Next episode is Tony Nestor. So getting you vamped up for it. Adventures in Bushcraft. This is, hey, I've been a bushcraft and survival instructor for 25 years. 
My name is Tony Nestor, and I know a thing or two. I'm going to share it by telling some of my adventures in the woods. Another real short book. It's like 85 pages, but uh, it's a guy who's experienced telling you about his experiences, and sometimes that's the best way to learn, by learning about someone's lifestyle, by learning about real-life events that have happened to real people. Tell you what, no... no uh, old survival book with line drawings is going to compete with that. That's for sure. Um, I'm not dissing any books with line drawings. I think they can be really extremely helpful, but learning from a true real life actually happened perspective is paramount. Here's another gem I picked up in British Columbia. Becoming Wild, Living the Primitive Life on a West Coast Island by Nikki Van Schindel, S-C-H-Y-N-D-E-L recommended actually by John Young who wrote What the Robin Knows and a lot of other books. This book is about someone who said, hey, I want to live in the woods. That sounds like fun. And they had a you know a base of skills, decided to go out and live a lifestyle of an outdoor person. I don't want to give away too much. There's a lot in this book. It's all about living on the West Coast of the United States uh, in, the, in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, read this one. It's all about a personal real life journey that happened. I'm a huge fan of uh, fiction books like Hatchet, uh, My Side of the Mountain, things like that. Those are about like lifestyle books, but they're fiction. These are real life lifestyle books. And now we get into the older books that are more about culture. And these are primarily written by, uh, you know, white folks who've gone into native cultures and documented what they do before it's essentially all lost. So before uh, these people forget or they they move too close to the modern technological world that you know the, the culture gets lost so hunters of the northern ice by richard k nelson all about hunters in the uh, in the north eskimo hunters by the way it calls them eskimo in this i know i'm gonna get folks who are like hey that's racist not in that book, at least. We can learn a lot from them. Uh, Hunters of the Northern Forest. It's a, a similar book, but obviously it's not just about the ice. It's about the Northern Forest. Um, another lifestyle book. This one, however, you'd think it's by the same author. This one's by Virginia Alexandria. Or Alexandria, Virginia. So while this book and you know Hunters of the Northern Ice, they focus a lot on culture. So there's that aspect. These people uh, have a culture that is completely revolving around living in the wilderness. Their culture is survival, so to speak. And I'm doing air quotes for those of you who are not watching. Uh, their culture is wilderness living. So that is an excellent book to look through. Again, these are cheap books, guys. These are inexpensive books. Always Getting Ready. It's another great book. You pick Eskimo subsistence in Southwest Alaska by James H. Barker. It's going to be our last culture book that we go over. There's tons more, um, tons that I haven't read yet, but just books about people who have lived this lifestyle for thousands of years. Thankfully it's been documented now and we can, you know, we can learn from it from the comfort of our living rooms in Nebraska or wherever the heck you guys live. So for those of you, big pile of books just falls over. For those of you who are, uh, for those of you who are still with me, thank you so much. Uh, you're either gonna love or hate that podcast because there's a lot of info being thrown at you, but I just wanted to talk about books, how they can benefit you, what books to get, uh, what categories there are, and to view the world of book learning as more than just reading a survival book, so to speak. So many different categories to learn from. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, Sam Larson, host of the Woodsong Wilderness podcast, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day.